Amen. All right, we are continuing this sermon series called The Being Challenge. We're kind of in the first week of it now. Hopefully everyone has been able to read in the book up to page six oh, over there. I'm seeing some eyes that are doing this right now. That's all right. That's, uh, that's all right. You can catch up. You can, you can catch up. It's um, the people that I've heard from people that, that have read it have really enjoyed it so far. Like that's, and, and that's kind of the thing that I hear about all of this. They, they've enjoyed the readings thus far. Um, so we're on page six, uh, day six today, not page six. It's like page 40 something, but, but it's actually day six. So uh, that's, that's what we're going through this week. And, and I encourage you again, uh, there is um, together group, small group, whatever you want to call it, materials on the website. And it is 1041 right now that it will release on the website at 11 o'clock. And that will have curriculum that you can go through, some questions to ask, ask, ask of yourself in the group that you're around, and also a video to watch. So you can do it. Just grab some people together and do it. Do it with your family. Do it with people around you. Um, you can come to my group, but either one of my groups if you want to. Uh, find some people together to maybe, eh, we could just kind of walk through this. Um, it's not dependent on the reading either. It's just kind of talking about com um, community and all that. And you get to hear Zach talk. Uh, and Zach is a much better preacher than I am, right? I know, I know what you're saying. You're like, no, how could that be? I appreciate it. I'll, I'll, get, I'll give you the five dollars later. Right? Like that's all, all that, all that stuff. Like, I'll, I'll, like I appreciate that. So, but uh, but you get to you get to listen to him talk on on that video for for a little bit here, but. Um, so, so we're doing this red letter, it's called the Red Letter Being Challenge, it's part of, part of that, and the Red Letter Challenge was kind of designed to get us closer to Jesus, right, and the first part of that is being, and the whole point behind being is creating five habits, being with Jesus, creating these five habits, and, and we quote this one quote of Jesus from the message translations a lot during the sermon series, and it says, walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. And I love how that, that put it, how Eugene put that in, in the uh, message translation. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Because oftentimes we feel like many, many of the stuff in the faith is forced. Well, these habits help us see this unforced rhythm of grace. So the first habit we're talking about is commit to community. And to, to talk about community, we first need to talk about these lines right here. All right. So there was a study done in the 50s that involved this. Now, here's what I want you to do. You guys will participate in this study. Let's see how you do. You have the line on the left and the box on the left. Then you have the three choices, A, B, and C, on the right. How, which one is the same length to the one on the left? C. C. Does anyone want to disagree with that? No, no one publicly, right? Like, like, the, like over there, yeah, C, C, right? It's obvious. It's obvious C, right? It's obvious C, but when this was done by, let's see, what is his name? Solomon Ash back in the 1950s, he asked the same question to his participants over there, and he got 75% answered A. What? What? What is this trickery? What lies are you telling today? Like all, all these things. So, and I'm, I'm sure you're, you look at it, you're like, it's definitely C. You're definitely, and you're right. If you were, if we were to put those together, it is C, but he still got A. But that's not the point, it's just doing that. It's how he did the test. Because what he would do is he would, he also hired a bunch of paid actors, okay? A bunch of paid actors. Oh, you're like, oh, I see where we're going now. He hired a bunch of paid actors, and, and he then had one test participant. And he would come in and fill a room with these one test uh, participant plus the actors around, and all the actors were instructed to say that they think it was A in there. All right? So, and what he found out is that when it was just like one actor and the participant, like, and the actor would say, A, the guy would go, this guy's a moron. Like, like it's, it's obviously C. And he would say C. But as you added more of the actors to the participants, 
it changed. The answer would change. Like he, and you could see the visual like pain on this on the participant's face. He's like, it's definitely C. But as more and more and more people would would come come to to, to say A, the participants would usually seventy five percent of the time would capitulate, and even though he knew in his heart that the answer was C, he would say A. Right? Ooh. Ooh. That's what we call, uh, to this 90s kid, it's called peer pressure, my friends. Right? But what it tells us is that community matters. You know, we're influenced by the people that that are around us and and how we think about things and all all that stuff. So our first little question we got to ask ourselves, like, you know, what's what's the influences? What's our community of influence that's around us? And we're going to give you a little bit of a little bit of stuff to, to go on that today. So, <clears throat> um, but it shows us it's all incredibly important. So again, I stress. I said this earlier, but if you really want to understand the thrust of the Bible, reading Genesis and Exodus is incredibly important. And so you're like, I've seen those books. The books are long. They are. They are. But they're good. They're so good. Uh, it <clears throat> it's. I know DJ and Katie look at, back with fondness as we on zoom in the lockdown would just read genesis and exodus right like fondness right like that's oh yeah oh yeah see nodding their heads like yeah yes yes like that's but but we did that and we've done it in a few of the adult bible studies over the time if you can read genesis and exodus and get a handle on what's going on in those it'll help guide you into the rest of the bible It'll help guide you in, into that. And what we see in Genesis chapter 2, at the very beginning of this, you see this establishment of community where the Lord God says it's not good for man to be alone. You know, like this is it's this whole sense of, the, of togetherness of the people of God there even then. Like this togetherness of, of the creation and, and people that are in it, right? It's, it's important to be alone. But the problem is, is that this isn't always so easy. This isn't like just to be with other people, you know, it takes a little bit of insecurity in our part and like to, to, to get to, to, together in community. Even before COVID, <clears throat> uh, they said that uh, loneliness is a significant problem. Let's see, what was it? Cigna Health did a, did a study that said 61% of the population is lonely. Like that's, that's before lockdown and all of that stuff. That's... That's a lot. That's a lot. And I can understand that. That's, I, I can understand that. And this, and this actually reminds me of one of my favorite jokes. It's the one Kevin was making fun of, but Kevin's not funny. All right? He's not funny. Like, that, that's it. The, um, but it's one of my favorite jokes. It's a pastor's joke. But what the joke, the, the joke is is that the greatest miracle Jesus ever did, better than, better than, like, turning water into wine and all that, the greatest miracle that Jesus ever actually did was having 12 close friends in his 30s. Yeah, like, it's funny. It's a good pastor's joke, right? Like, uh, that's, it's, I, I, I think because it's true. It's true. Like, you get, uh, you get older. Like, in college, you just got friends all around you. You get older, and it's like, oh, man. Like, it's, life gets diff- more difficult. It gets in the way. And that's why it's important that we do all this stuff about community, right? That... And we, and we see that Jesus, you know, it, God created, you know, it's not good for man to be alone. And we see when Jesus comes in, he does the same stuff. He brings in community all around him. The gospel lesson was all about him calling the disciples around him. We see as we look at all the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that Jesus is inviting people into community with him. And I hear what you're saying. You're like, pastor, then how are we supposed to do this? Well, maybe Solomon can give us some wisdom. I forgot to put it up on the board, but I was playing yesterday, so you got to forgive me. But, but it says, the Pro- Proverbs 13, 20 says that if you walk with the wise, then you will become wise, but a companion of fools suffers him, right? Like, right? So like, basically what it's saying, like, yeah, yeah, you need to hang out with people that are smart, right? And if you hang out with the dummies, you're going to suffer because of it, right? Like, so yeah, just go out and do that, right? That's how we do community? No, 
No, no, no, no, no. Like that's, we can't just have any community. One thing that we see, and you're going to see this in your workbooks this week, in your, in your, in your being challenged book, is that Jesus had these different like l- levels of community. And I thought this was pretty wise on Zach's part to notice this. He says, after the resurrection of Jesus, that Jesus actually appeared to like 500 people. That's a lot. That's a big list of like saying goodbyes and all that stuff. It's like sometimes Christmas can feel like that. You know, you're like, all right, well, we're heading back to Florida. We'll see you guys later. It's like, well, you need to go say, say goodbye to Mambi and Pop Pop, you know, and Seagull or whatever. I don't know what you guys call grandparents. You, you, know, you know, Grandpa Seagull. But that, that's, you know, you, and you got to hold, you got to do hold the whole line. You know, and all, all they got to see everyone, have, have, got to have the receiving line. Well, Jesus had a line of like 500 people that he went and saw, right? He had, he had 500 people after he rose. So we had that 500. But also in the midst of the story of Jesus, we see that he sends out 72. Well, that's a little bit more than the, the disciples, right? The 12 of the disciples. Like he sends out the 72 out of there. You see these people that are closer to Jesus than those 500. A little closer. And then, of course, we know about the 12. But you know that there's even three that are closer than that. Peter, James, and John, right? Peter, James, and John. So you have the 500, the 72, the 12, and the three. In the book this week, it's going to ask you, it's like, who are those groups to you? Who are those big groups? And who are the close groups? friends it's going to lead you on that but these three had peter james and john had unprecedented access to jesus like the the transfiguration when jesus was up on the mountain and he became all bright and shiny and god said this is my son listen to him and moses and elijah appeared to him peter james saw were there were there to see that they saw when Jairus's daughter was raised from the dead you know he we see he see they get these unprecedented access closeness to jesus Jesus is inviting people to community. He says that you are not alone. Now, when you're thinking about it, you're probably going, yeah, but those disciples were perfect, right? They they never messed up. Like, Jesus chose the perfect community so that he would be able to accomplish God's will for his life, right? Like, if you've listened to two sermons of mine, especially this last, last, any time we go through Christmas, Anytime we go through like a gospel, like I make fun of the disciples pretty hardcore because they're not, they're not the best people always, are they? They're not, they're not the, they're not the most high on there. Even in Acts chapter four, it says that the, they describe themselves as being unschooled and ordinary men. But even beyond that, we see the disciples like Peter has, oftentimes is, is, has like a hot temper. Like there's that one, one story where, where Jesus is being arrested in the garden and, and Peter like freaks out a little bit. He's like, oh no, and he grabs one of the guard's sword and he's like, and he swings it around and cuts one of the guard's ears off. And you can just imagine that ear like falling down from, off onto the ground and Jesus is like, what are you guys doing? Stop it. Like, am I, yeah, what are you doing? This isn't how this is supposed to be. And then Jesus like picks up the ear off of him like, Wipes it off, and all, you know, and, and like, like puts, it, puts it back on, on. You can't put ear in that heat. You can't put dirt in that healing, you know? Like, that's got to get it nice and clean beforehand. Like, it's, you know, he does this. Like, what are you doing, Peter? But, you know, um, James and John were called the sons of thunder. Do you, do you know one of the reasons why we think they're called the sons of thunder? Because there's this one time when, when they're walking around and they go to this town uh, in a Samaritan village and they hate what they see there, and they ask Jesus, do you want us to call hellfire onto it? Oh my goodness, these are some of the disciples. I didn't know there were boomers in the Bible. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But that, that's like, they wanted to like destroy the whole, whole town, and Jesus is like, what are you guys talking about? Like, what are you doing? These guys weren't perfect james and john also wanted to they also were arguing one time about which one of them was the greatest right i'm so much better than you because i did this right i'd most of it and then the most petty thing was between john and peter and this is so subtle 
it's so subtle, but I love it so much, is that when, G, when the Lord rose, you know, when Jesus on the cross has taken all of our sin and shame with him and, and died and it buried in the tomb and he rose from the tomb, leaving us with just a newness of life and glory. John describes him seeing this as thus. He goes, Peter and the disciple whom Jesus loved. This is how, 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 how uh, you guys know where I'm going. This is how, how John described himself. They both heard about it and they wanted to see it was true. So they both began to run. That's the only detail they needed to do. But John kept it going. I should have put it on the board here, but again, I was having fun yesterday. The, uh, and, and they get there, and, and it says that John arrived to the tomb before Peter, right? John is basically gloating that he won a foot race in the resurrected glory against Peter, right? He's like, Peter is very slow. You guys need to understand that. Even in... Even in the resurrected glory, no one could help his legs, right? Like, even, even in that, they go over there. Like, why does that? These guys, aren't, these guys aren't good. Those are like the tight-knit group of Jesus guys, right? It's not just the 12. It's just it's those three in there. And that, that reminds us of our own community. That If that was the tight-knit group around Jesus, we also in our communities are going to face hurts and pains we're going to fall short. We're going to hurt someone's feelings. Those things are going to happen. We're even going to gloat about foot races that we're still talking about 2,000 years later. So what does it look like for our community? What, is, what does it mean then? If it's not built around perfection, if it's not all that, then what is its purpose? What's the purpose behind our, our community? Well, this is a big image in this, in this sermon series. It's one that we're taking aim at things. And the aim of our community is Jesus and his death and resurrection. And what that means is grace and peace and forgiveness. Grace, forgiveness, and peace. That the aim of our communities that, that, we, so that we commit ourselves to aim around Jesus. And that means that because Jesus is the ultimate reflection of grace, forgiveness, and peace that our communities then are aimed at Jesus and they exist around grace, forgiveness, and peace. So what are those communities that you're around? What are the 500? What are the 72? What are the 12? What are the three? There's all kinds of communities that are around us. And some of the communities, and this is what makes it so hard. Listen, Life changes constantly as we, as we come around, right? It's, it doesn't mean that it's any harder or, or easier than before. Sometimes things are harder, but I think some of it is communities look weird now. Like, because it's really easy to get online and find a, find a new community. Or it's really easy to watch TV and say that that's, that's, my, that's my community. But my question is, is, is that community helping you point to Christ? And is that community helping you live a grace-filled life, a forgiving life, and one, and one that is bringing you closer into Jesus? That's, that's the question that we have for, for ourselves there. Because it's important for these communities to center around forgiveness. And this is how we wrap it all back up into that flood narrative. Because if our communities that we commit to if it's not centered around forgiveness and grace and peace, then it's centered on loneliness. Because without forgiveness, we'll eventually just kick the people out that we don't like. For a, for a stark image of this, read The Beginning of the Great Divorce by C.S. Lewis. I just read The Magician's Nephew by C.S. Lewis as well, and there's a stark image of that, too, of this world that has died because of just loneliness and selfishness on part of people and getting rid of people that we don't agree with. We see Jesus, what he did is he brought the community together to him. And he didn't choose a perfect community, 
but he chose forgiveness and grace and peace. Because I look out here and I see that he's done that with all of you guys. Listen, I know many of you in here. I've talked to many of you. You ain't perfect, right? You know, right? Like, I know, I know. And like, I look back at all the communities that I've spent time with and, and they're not perfect. Like, I look back in my life in the church I grew up in, Prince of Peace in Douglasville, Georgia. We have a new member uh, here that joined this, la- this last time and she, was t- and she goes, oh, I used to go to that church before you were born. And she told me stories about what happened in that church. And they're horrendous stories. And I'm like, you know, that sounds right. That sounds familiar. Like I was part of that church. They did some weird things. But like they raised me up and kind of brought me to where I am now. Some of you think I'm joking. <laughs> I am not. Like, like, like the toxic group of people like, so, oh, oh, over there. But but also I look at like my college. I went to a college called Atlanta Christian College. I, you know, I, I knew I was going to be a pastor. I didn't really think I'd stay in the Lutheran church because my only Lutheran purview was this little church over here that was weird. And, uh, and, and I was like, I'm not going to be part of the Lutheran church. But I look back at that life now in college and, and the, the, the professors that were around me and the leadership and how they kind of surrounded me and helped me become a better leader myself and like all these, all these things go, go swirling around and that's where I was like, oh, I'll stay in the Lutheran church. Like there was a decision made by a bunch of non-Lutherans that helped me get to the, back to be a pastor in the Lutheran church. It's, it's wild, right? It's this community. And that community was not perfect. And I have a good example to it. That college made us sign a piece of paper. Some of you may agree with this. Hmm. All right. But they would have us sign a piece of paper that while we were members there, we were not allowed to have any alcohol whatsoever, no matter our age. Hmm. Fun times, right? Like, like that's like that was that that was that that was that college, and it it helped guide me to there. And then seminary, right? Seminary, like. Listen, I know you guys look at the pastors and you're like, oh, they're so holy and good and all that stuff. Yes, they're so holy and good. I don't need to ruin the, the witness of other guys, but my goodness, you know, like that, that's, it's, it's not, not perfect at all, but I was hanging out with my friend Dan Ross yesterday and he and I were just laughing and joking about the past and talking about what our ministries look like today. And, and I was telling him about, uh, I hadn't seen him in a while, so we had completed the, the daycare and and so I was talking about that with him and and he and and I said what was great about that project is we were really getting a lot of flack from LCEF and I don't know if you guys remember that Sunday but there was that one Sunday where we were like it doesn't look like LCEF's going to give us the loan and so we said hey we need you guys to help support this and we like put up like a four percent bond or something like that and I called LCEF that night because I raised something like six hundred thousand dollars like before that evening I called our LCEF representative I'm like we don't need you right I, I said this on the phone to LCEF and 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 they had it figured out by the morning which means People that are paid more than I probably ever will be got a call and had to get on a Zoom call or something in the middle of the night in their jammies and figure out how they were going to figure out that what was going on in this church, right? And because of that, because of you guys in this church, we now... we. We changed how LCF writes loans. <laughs> like that, that happened, right? I take too much pride in that. I take too much pride in that. And my friend laughs out loud at that. He goes, what is it about our year? Because he goes, I have, because of things he's done, he's personally changed bylaws in Synod and, and things like that. Like all this, so I don't know what it is about. Listen, we are not perfect. We are not perfect. But I look at the community, and I and I look back, and I'm like, gosh, you can see God's hand in these things, and that's what we have here too. Because again, I stress, you guys ain't perfect. Far from it, right? And yet, I think we'll look back 
five years from now, maybe even three or something like that, we'll look back and we're like, during that time, we see God's hand was in this. Where this imperfect community that was centered around Jesus, his death and his resurrection, brought about grace and forgiveness and peace wherever they went. And, and, I, and I think that's that idea of the aimed communities where you can see it happening and see it being accomplished there. And, and, and we, and we'll see where we go. And I'm looking forward to that journey. And so we'll end right there. Let's say a prayer. Jesus, we thank you that you love us and that you're with us. Lord, continue to guide us in all ways. Let us, let us, let us show love to one another. Let us show grace and peace and forgiveness because, Lord, let us keep you at the middle of our communities that you show us that grace, you show us that, that peace, and you show us that forgiveness by your death and resurrection. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much for listening to all of us.